Good morning everyone and welcome to our service of Book of Common Prayer Matins this morning at St Mary's Church, Frencham. I will be using the traditional language of the Book of Common Prayer, which will come up on your screen. So do know that as you join in, we all participate in this wondrous prayer together. So a few sentences to start off with. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do, when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, and to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary, as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and have given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that these things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. And so now we will have our first two lessons for our service of prayer today. The first lesson 
is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verses 8 to 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will look upon it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Here ends the first lesson. The New Testament reading is taken from the third chapter of the first letter of Peter, verses 18 to 22. For Christ also died for our sins once and for all. He, the just, suffered for the unjust to bring us to God. In the body he was put to death. In the spirit he was brought to life. And in the spirit he went and made his proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. They had refused obedience long ago, while God waited patiently in the days of Noah and the building of the ark. And in the ark a few persons, eight in all, were brought to safety through the water. This water prefigured the water of baptism through which you are now brought to safety. Baptism is not the washing away of bodily pollution, but the appeal made to God by a good conscience, and it brings salvation through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who entered heaven after receiving the submission of angelic authorities and powers, and is now at the right hand of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
My thanks to Joanna Bridges-Webb and to Patrick Farmer for giving us our lessons for today and also to Mike Smith and the Choir of St Mary's for giving us that truly Lenten hymn, 40 Days and 40 Nights. And now I will give the Gospel for today. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory be to thee, O Lord. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. And at, just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ, for this thy holy Gospel. And so now we are thankful to have Bishop Andrew Watson, our Bishop of Guildford, to give us our sermon for today. rainbows. They've been ubiquitous over the past year. Both the real things, including a glorious double arced affair that I witnessed over the local common just last week, and a thousand children's drawings, sellotaped to shop fronts and bedroom windows wherever you go. As a symbol, the rainbow has been passed from hand to hand in a global game of pass the parcel for centuries, providing one of the most enduring and versatile of all trademarks. And as the music stopped, it's variously been deployed by political reform movements, peace activists, anti-nuclear campaigners, anti-apartheid protesters, environmental demonstrators, the LGBTI plus community, and now supporters of the National Health Service. In one somewhat confusing episode earlier in the lockdown, a Plymouth bus company tweeted that they were planning to rebrand their buses, keeping the rainbow, but replacing the pride symbol with one that thanked the NHS. The subsequent outcry as to whether the music had started up again or not led to a change of policy and pride was restored, accompanied by an abject apology from the bus company. The poets and scientists have had their own controversies when it comes to rainbows, kicked off by John Keats, who famously reflected on how the scientific advances of his time were taking the wonder out of life, replacing the poetic with the merely prosaic. As he wrote in his poem, Lamia, Philosophy will clip an angel's wings, conquer all mysteries by rule and line, empty the haunted air and gnomid mine, unweave a rainbow, as if air well made the tender person Lamia melt into a shade. 180 years later, Richard Dawkins took up Keats's challenge in his book, Unweaving the Rainbow, arguing that scientific rationalism reveals the wonders of the universe rather than concealing them. And as we trace the symbol of the rainbow back through human history, one of its earliest manifestations is to be found in our Old Testament lectionary reading this morning from the book of Genesis. The flood has passed, Noah has released his family and other animals from the ark, together with a welcome command to go forth and multiply. God has promised that as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And then two things happen simultaneously. 
First, the Hebrew word berith appears for the very first time in scripture. And secondly, a rainbow appears in the sky. Berith. It's going to become one of the most important words in all Judeo-Christian theology. Indeed, the word with which the Christian separates the Old Testament from the New. Because Berith means a testament or a covenant, an agreement between two parties which sets them on a quite different legal basis. And here in Genesis chapter 9 is the very first of those covenants later to be supplemented by God's covenants with Abraham, Moses, David, and ultimately with all who are in Christ. In many ways, this first covenant is impressive in its scope. As God said to Noah, I am establishing a covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, that never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Every living creature is included here, not just humankind. The promise is for all time, rather than say a 999 year lease. And there's a generosity about the covenant here too, in that it's unconditional and not dependent on future good behaviour. Just one thing is missing though, and that is a sense of relationship lying at the heart of the covenant, of God and humanity being drawn, to, drawn together into a place of mutual love and commitment. In future covenants, that omission would be remedied as Abraham and Moses, the so-called friends of God, would take their place alongside David, the so-called man after God's own heart, as covenant partners with the Almighty. But this first covenant was more distant than that, more emotionally detached, beautiful but remote. Though nonetheless welcome, I'm sure, as words of reassurance in man's enduring battle with the elements. So how about the rainbow in the sky? What was the symbolism here of this most ubiquitous of all images? Some commentators have seen it as a sign that God was metaphorically hanging up his bow rather than using it again to execute justice. Others have pointed to God's glory as contrasted with the darkness of human nature and to the sheer radiance of his faithfulness towards all that he has made. Still others have developed that theme of beautiful but remote, which characterises both the berith and the rainbow. And I don't know about you, but certainly to Beverly and myself, who have no difficulty in holding together Pete Keats's perspective from that of Richard Dawkins, the appearance of a rainbow in the sky has often lifted our hearts, sometimes at the toughest of moments, as in the words of that old hymn, we've traced the rainbow through the rain and felt the promise is not vain, that morn shall tearless be. On to our Gospel reading today, and there's no time for rainbows in Mark's whistle-stop tour of the early days of Jesus' ministry, which leads us from Nazareth to the River Jordan to the Judean Desert and back to Galilee again in the course of just seven short verses. But there is time for the heavens to be torn open, for the Spirit to alight on Jesus like a dove, and for a voice from heaven, You are my Son, my Beloved, in whom I am well pleased before Jesus embarks on those 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. Peter, perhaps rather fancifully, later referred to that baptismal moment in terms of Noah's Ark, with Jesus pictured as a latter-day Noah steering the boat through treacherous waters and so carrying his family to safety. That's in our epistle reading today, which incidentally was written to the churches in Asia Minor where Noah's Ark was widely thought to have landed. However in battle the little churches in that region were feeling, Peter is saying, the death and resurrection of Jesus, as symbolised by his stepping down into the waters of baptism and up again the other side, proclaims his lordship over all the forces that oppressed them. And while Peter's argument might be a little hard to follow here, one thing is absolutely clear that at the heart of the story of Jesus lies the signing of a new covenant, which has relationship absolutely front and centre. 
First and foremost, the unique relationship between God and the one who is greater than Abraham or Moses or David, who is far more than God's friend or a man after God's own heart, who is none other than my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. And springing from that, the relationship between God and all who are in Christ, as beautifully described by Peter in the first verse of our epistle reading. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. Why? In order to bring you to God. And so to Lent 2021. And as today's readings present us with some rather sombre locations, Noah's world emerging from a global catastrophe, Jesus' wilderness with wild animals, Mark tells us, on the prowl, Peter's little church is feeling small and fragile and embattled. So we are all too conscious of the dark backdrop of this Lent for many people and especially for those most affected by our global catastrophe, almost challenged by the fears that stalk them at night time, almost anxious about the fragile and embattled nature of the churches in their care. In normal times, it's easy to ignore the season of Lent or to pay it lip service, perhaps by giving up chocolate or cutting down on our alcohol consumption. But this year, it feels as though Lent has been thrust upon us. Indeed, perhaps that we've been living Lent for the best part of 12 months. And while I hope that there have been moments of joy for you during that time as well, as there have for me, and while there's a rising confidence in our national vaccination programme, together with a growing hope that life may return to some kind of normality sometime soon, there's also a greater seriousness to Lent this time round the normal, the trivial, the superficial, the shallow seem somehow out of place in the face of all that we've been going through together. The rainbow may be a powerful symbol of hope this Lent, not least in the lap where it's most recently landed, an expression of our thankfulness to the NHS and our trust in the vaccination rollout programme. But interestingly, rainbows hardly figure in the New Testament other than a couple of times in the book of Revelation where they encircle the throne of God. Instead, a new symbol comes to take its place, which exchanges the beauty and remoteness of the rainbow for something that could hardly be uglier or more in your face. For if the sign of the first covenant was a rainbow, the sign of the second covenant, the new covenant, is an old rugged cross. Or to put it more graphically, this is a covenant signed in the precious blood of Christ, the one whom, as the letter to the Hebrews puts it, is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted through better promises. The truth perhaps is this, that alongside our prayers for an increasingly effective rollout of the vaccination programme, not just here but across the world, we should equally be praying for an increasingly effective rollout of the Gospel programme, not just here, but across the world. For these better promises of a better covenant are quite remarkable in their scope and ambition. Not something beautiful and distant, but something upfront and deeply personal. Nothing short of what St Peter described as a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you. And so to close with a great benediction for Lent from the letter to the Hebrews, let's bow our heads to pray. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Andrew. 
And now as we are in Lent, we say the Benedictus. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hands of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our forefathers, to remember his holy covenant, to perform the oath which he sware to our forefather Abraham that he would give us, that we, being delivered out of the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people for the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And so now our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Endue thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people, and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. So let us pray. We pray for deliverance from temptation and grace in our Lenten resolutions, and we pray to our Lord God. As we are sealed as your own by baptism, Grant to us the spirit of repentance for sin and resolution for good. We ask that you strengthen your church, that it may be a refuge from evil, a place that is open for all who wish to come seeking you, for all who have faith and all who say that they don't. We pray to you, God of resolution and reconciliation, that we may all be joined with you on our Lenten journey. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
we pray for your created world, which is sustained by your mercy, but threatened by human greed and indifference. We ask that you teach us to live in better harmony with the seasons of the year and with all our fellow creatures. Stir in our hearts this Lent to be less polluting, to use less plastic, to be more considerate to all creatures. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask that you enable the teachers and youth leaders of all churches and schools and colleges, all who lead the young, that they lead them in the right way, opening their hearts and minds to knowledge and experience. We pray especially for all schools at this time in this pandemic who are trying to assist children to be supported and to increase their learning. And we pray especially for all parents who are homeschooling. We thank you for the energy of love that you give in a family that makes this possible. And we pray for the families that are struggling, where there is strife, where there is anger or fear. And we pray to you, Lord God of resolution, to help solve this problem. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray at this time for all who have succumbed to the COVID-19 virus. We pray, loving Lord, especially for those who are bereft, who have not been able to see their loved ones. And we pray for all who are in hospital at this moment, suffering with this virus. We pray for our nurses, our doctors and all hospital staff, for paramedics, for police and fire personnel, all those who are helping to keep us safe. And we thank you for the blessing of all the teams that are vaccinating people as quickly as they can. We thank you for the science behind the vaccine and for all who helped to develop it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray also that you have mercy on victims of other disease or other problems throughout the world. Especially we pray for those who are buried, as it were, in the snow or the freezing temperatures. For those who are suffering with flood. For those who are suffering with drought. Bring relief in areas where nature is harsh and living is difficult. Give strength to those who work to reclaim the waste places of this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for those who have found peace through the saving death of Jesus Christ. We remember all those whom we love but see no longer and pause for a moment to hold them in our hearts before you, knowing that they rest in your light which is perpetual. We pray that we, like them, may share in the power of Jesus' resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray through Jesus Christ, who was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Amen. And so the collect for the first Sunday of Lent, let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ fasted 40 days in the wilderness and was tempted as we are yet without sin, give us grace to discipline ourselves in obedience to your Spirit and 
as you know our weakness, so may we know your power to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defence, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance to do always that is righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so let us say, the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen.
During this difficult time when our church buildings are closed, we're still a church. Meeting virtually for prayer services and fellowship. Loving our neighbours by offering practical support to the vulnerable and caring for our communities. The work of our church is reliant on people's generosity, a generosity that is a hallmark of a lived out faith and a testament to it. We give to our church in a variety of ways, but with the closure of all our buildings, we cannot receive all the gifts that we usually would. So we really need your help now.